Apocalypse 2.0, From Dinosaurs to Doomsday, with Steve Busetti, Jurassic World Dominion. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now this week, it's Apocalypse 2.0, From Dinosaurs to Doomsday. Doomsday! Doomsday! We'll be talking with Steve Bursati, consulting paleontologist for Jurassic World Dominion on how to survive in the time of dinosaurs from Nat Geo. Now, life 66 million years ago is far different than the one we inhabit today. In fact, you know what? I'm pretty sure of a time machine around here somewhere. Ah, oh, yeah. Here we go. Anyway, I just set this for the end of the Cretaceous period 66 million years ago this last Thursday, and... <laughs> Here we are! For most of the 150 million years or so that dinosaurs ruled the planet, the land masses of Earth were concentrated into the supercontinent Pangea. Now, near the end of the Cretaceous period, this massive land mass is starting to tear apart, forming the Atlantic Ocean. See that? It's right. It's cute, isn't it? Over two million years, western regions of North America were home to 1.7 billion Tyrannosaurus rex, along with Triceratops, Segmontosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and the Pachycephalosaurus. Now, far larger than any of these species were the Titanosaurs, who lived in what is now India. Uh, some of these may have measured 15 to 20 meters long, or 75 to 100 adult cardinals in length. Now, living in the lands we now call Montana and the Dakotas was a ferocious, if tiny, little beast known as the Anzu. With a distinctive thick crest on its head, a beak, and no teeth, their friends called them chickens from hell! Just <laughs> not to their faces. What? You don't think chickens can stand up for themselves? Watch this. Well, this is quite the night at the fights. In the land that's soon gonna be New Jersey. It's 50 chickens versus a velociraptor. Oh, and here come the chickens. Oh, they look furious. The velociraptor jumps up and down. Oh, it's too much. He's being overwhelmed. Oh, the chickens are surrounding him and the velociraptor goes down. Victor, by murder most foul, the chickens. Roughly 66 million years ago, um, an asteroid larger than Mount Everest bore down on the Earth, impacting the Yucatan Peninsula, sending flames and tsunamis spreading around the globe. Dust and debris thrown into the atmosphere blocked out the sun for up to two years, stunting plant growth around the globe. Sulfuric acid aerosols quickly acidified the oceans. Soon, 70% of all plants and animal species around the world were no more. Bird-like dinosaurs and small mammals, however, would soon take back this battered world. Next up, we're going to talk with Steve Brissotti, consulting paleontologist for Jurassic World Dominion, talking about this ancient era and on how to survive in the time of dinosaurs from Nat Geo. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined by Steve Bursati. He is a paleontologist and a contributor to Nat Geo Kid's new work, How to Survive in the Age of Dinosaurs. 
Welcome to the show, Steve. Well, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk dinosaurs. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, first of all, can you just, you know, I know dinosaurs lived a whole long time, 140, 160 million years, something like that. But can you give us an idea of what life might have been like in the age of dinosaurs? And that's the whole point of this new book from Nat Geo, it, you know, How to Survive in the Age of Dinosaurs. It, it, it is a book about what it says on the cover. And so we hope that this book engages kids with what it would actually be like if you were there back during the time that dinosaurs ruled the world. And you're right. It wasn't a single time that dinosaurs ruled the world. It was more than 150 million years, beginning with what uh, we call the Triassic period. This was a time uh, about 230 million years ago when the first dinosaurs lived. There was only a single giant continent, the supercontinent of Pangaea. There were these mega monsoon storms that ravaged that supercontinent. The first dinosaurs were quite small, humble, the size of dogs, the size of humans. Then in the next interval of time, the Jurassic period, the continents began to split apart and move around. And this is when some of the truly giant dinosaurs lived, the Brontosauruses and Brachiosauruses. And then the last of the three intervals of the age of dinosaurs, the Cretaceous period, this mm -hmm. was the time of T-Rex and Triceratops. So all in all, this is over 150 million years. The Earth was very different from today. But of course, the Earth was changing during that time. There were changes in climate, changes in temperature. The continents were moving around. And so that's why I think it's really fascinating to put ourselves in the shoes of an explorer that would go back to this age and say, what would it be like to stare down at T-Rex, to see a flock of velociraptors coming over the hill? And I think uh, it's a whole lot of fun to have those thought experiments. Wow. Wow. It's just so imaginative, you know? But, you know, I think when people think of dinosaurs, we often think of the major hunters, the carnivores, velociraptors, Tyrannosaurus. But it wasn't that simple, was it? There were, no. there were a lot of other types of dinosaurs out there. there. Certainly were, including the one behind you in your background, the one with the long neck and the big belly and the long tail. Uh, that's what we call a sauropod dinosaur. That's just the technical name for the long neck dinosaurs, Brontosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, all of those famous ones are sauropods. And they were not ferocious animals. They were not meat eaters. They were plant eaters. They were probably fairly gentle most of the time. Of course, some of them were enormous. The biggest ones were heavier than a Boeing 737 airplane, if you can believe. It's a factoid that still, even as a scientist who studies the dinosaurs, that blows my mind that these actual real are heavier than a jet plane. So you wouldn't want to get too close to them. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near their hands or feet because they would have crushed <laughs> you like a human crushing an ant. But otherwise, they weren't scary. They didn't have sharp teeth. They wouldn't have tried to eat you. The reality is that dinosaurs were incredibly varied in their sizes and their diets and their behaviors, just like, say, animals, mammals, let's say, are today. You think of bats and whales and elephants and tigers and kangaroos and humans and just all the diversity among mammals that was similar with dinosaurs. And lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> so let's say you had to be an animal in, I don't know, the Triassic or whatever, what, what is your, um, what type of animal would, would you want to be if you wanted to have the greatest chance of success? Now, so if we went back to the, the Triassic period, this was the time when there was that single supercontinent. It was one slab of land that stretched from North Pole to South Pole. All of today's continents were part of that. Uh, it was a land of harsh and extreme climate. There were big storms. Uh, that, that pummeled the coasts of that supercontinent. There were huge deserts that spanned across much of the interior of that supercontinent. So the types of animals that did very well were ones that could deal with the heat and with the uncertainty of those storms. So animals that were fairly small, that could hide easily, they would be in good shape. It was a time when there were dinosaurs, but the dinosaurs were not particularly big. You didn't have anything the size of T-Rex or the size of Brontosaurus. They would eat there. And in part, it was because of that really harsh weather that prevented dinosaurs from getting bigger and properly spreading around that supercontinent. Hmm. And so let's say, you know, later on, you're being chased by 
a bunch of velociraptors. <laughs> <You know? laughs> now, as far as the movies go, apparently you're supposed to run into a kitchen and hide underneath a metal table. So. Yeah, even that wasn't safe, though, in the film. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your best... What, you're being chased by a pack of velociraptors. What's your best hope? Well, velociraptor was a, a ferocious predator. Not quite what the movies portray, by the way. And I mean no disrespect to Jurassic Park. So I, I worked on the latest film on Jurassic World Dominion. I was a paleontology consultant on that film. So I had a lot of fun, and I tried my best to bring the modern understanding of dinosaurs, of real fossils, real science to the filmmakers. And I'm very pleased with how they use that information to shape some of the new dinosaurs in the film. But the velociraptors always have been a little bit inaccurate on the big screen. They're far too big. The real velociraptors were only the size of poodles. And by that, I mean miniature poodles. Yep. Imagine a bunch of miniature poodles with huge sickle-shaped claws on their feet. <laughs> That's uh, probably, at least at times, would have lived together, maybe even hunted together. Uh, and the real velociraptors were covered in feathers. They had feathers all over their bodies. They even had wings on their arms. They would have looked a lot like a bird, especially something like... Um, uh, 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 an emu, a cassowary, something like this, some mm -hmm. of the larger birds today. So if you were facing those kind of dinosaurs, they were pretty smart. They had keen senses. Uh, they could run pretty fast. And if they did hunt in packs, and there's at least some evidence from fossils that they did, you wouldn't have had to deal with just one, but with many of them. I think, frankly, you would probably need a firearm <laughs> to have, have a, some hope against a marauding pack of velociraptors. But of course, you know, we can always as humans use our intelligence to learn about how animals hunt and how they move to devise strategies. So I think in reality, if we live with velociraptors, we would have a lot of learning experiences where some of our friends maybe didn't make it, but we would learn from that to find a way to outsmart them. Hmm. And um, so how did you folks pull together all of your ideas for this book? It's pretty amazing work that you did here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I'm excited about it because it is a National Geographic book. So, you know, it's good. It has that yellow border seal of approval. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it's it's going to be engaging. It's going to be fun. But also the science is going to point. That's what they brought me to advise on it. It was written by an excellent children's writer, Stephanie Grinnell. Uh, I did my, yeah. my best. Yeah, we've small. had Stephanie on this show before. Oh, have you? Great. So yeah, you know she's fantastic. Yeah, she's yeah. Awesome. Uh, very experienced uh, and very talented uh, writer. And so she dove into the world of dinosaurs. She wrote the, the draft of the book. Um, she immersed herself in the science and did an amazing job of learning about the real dinosaurs and the real fossils. And then came to me to make sure that the facts were correct. And frankly, I didn't have to do a whole lot of correcting. She really nailed it. But I gave some advice and, and some feedback here and there, and I gave that scientist stamp of approval. Um, <laughs> There's a lot of information. And she yes, I say. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I think when people think of paleontology, you know, we, you know, picture of being out in a field somewhere in Siberia, digging, digging into a mountainside with a, with a toothbrush and a teaspoon. Uh, <laughs> and certainly there's a lot of digging probably still going on in paleontology. Yeah. But what, how has technology changed the science of mm -hmm. paleontology and being a paleontologist? Technology has changed things dramatically. But... Only it's changed part of paleontology. Technology has yet to really help us find and dig up fossils. When it comes to finding fossils, people have tried to use radar, sonar, ground penetrating, uh, you know, computers, these kind of things to see if there's fossils underground. Can we see them in the rocks before we dig? And no, it just doesn't work. Yeah. So to find a fossil, it's really a still uh, an old fashioned game, almost like being a gold prospector. You try to identify the places where there might be fossils, where there's the right types of rocks of the right age to maybe have dinosaurs in them. And then you go there and you look and you walk around and you see if anything interesting is sticking out of the rocks, anything of a different color, a different texture, something that has a recognizable shape to it. If you see something like that, you take out your tools, your hammers, your chisels, you'll dig in more. 
And that's when you hope maybe there's a skeleton under there. There's no technology that really helps. But when the technology does help is when we bring the fossils back to the lab. Mm. And when we study them and we can use supercomputers, we can use CAT scanners to see inside of the dinosaur bone, see the brain cavity, see the ear, learn about their senses. We can use computer modeling to study how they moved, how they walked, how big they were. So that's where the technology really comes in. Hmm. And one of the most famous things, of course, about dinosaurs is the big rock hitting Earth 66 million years ago. And, you know, we talk now about, you know, birds being the descendants of dinosaurs. And, you know, birds did evolve first well into the, during the age of dinosaurs. But what made, what allowed them to survive whereas the big dinosaurs didn't. 66 million years ago, it was just an average day <laughs> and for dinosaurs. T-Rex was there, Triceratops was there, and little did they know that their world was going to change dramatically and change forever, because that day, a six-mile-wide rock that was hurtling through the heavens, a piece of space junk, it could have gone anywhere. It was traveling like 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. It, it just so happened to make a beeline for the Earth. And it smashed into what is now Mexico. It detonated with the force of over a billion nuclear bombs put together. It punched a hole in the Earth more than 100 miles wide. You can still see some of that crater near Cancun in Mexico. Most is covered by the Gulf of Mexico by the water, but you can still see some of it on land. That asteroid impact was catastrophic. It's the biggest asteroid that's hit the Earth in the last half a billion years and it unleashed wildfires, tsunamis, earthquakes, all the dust and dirt and smoke went into the atmosphere. It blocked out the sun for many years. Forests collapsed. Plant eaters didn't have food to eat. They died. Meat eaters didn't have food to eat. They died. Ecosystems, they just imploded. They fell like a house of cards. And 5% of all species of animals died. You had a three out of four chance for your entire species going extinct. But a quarter made it through somehow. T-Rex didn't. Triceratops didn't. Uh, most dinosaurs were too big. They were too specialized. They ate very specialized types of food. It took them a long time to grow from a baby into an adult. They couldn't hide very easily. Those were all handicaps when the asteroid hit. But some mammals made it through. Our ancestors, because they were small, because they could eat lots of different food, because they could hide away in burrows. And one type of dinosaur made it through, a peculiar type of dinosaur with wings that could fly. And with a beak, that beak was really good for eating seeds. And seeds last a long time in the soil, even a long time after the trees die in the forest. The wings, of course, you know, allowing them to fly away from immediate danger. Those things help those dinosaurs, the ones we call birds, to be the only ones to make it through that fire and brimstone. And of course, they've survived until today. We do have dinosaurs in the world with us, which I think is an astounding thing to think about. And there's more than double the number of bird species today than mammal species. So in a way, the age of dinosaurs still does continue. Awesome. Uh, and so, you know, you've said, you know, you have, you know, shattered my idea of a terrifying velociraptor. And now I'm just picturing an annoying little poodle with feathers. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that one of the things that scared us in that in Jurassic Park about about Velociraptors was that they were portrayed as being so smart, so intelligent. So what would you consider to be some of the most intelligent dinosaurs that ever existed? The raptor dinosaurs were some of the most intelligent, maybe even the most intelligent. Uh, and you might ask, well, how do we know this? How do we know how smart a dinosaur was? Well, of course, we can't, you know, give it an IQ test. <laughs> we can't run it through a maze. But what we can do is CAT scan the skulls and use the x-rays of the scanner to see inside and build digital models of the brain by filling in the brain cavity. And we can measure the size and the shape and we can compare the size of the brain and the size of the different regions of the brain that control different senses. We can compare those to modern day animals and get a general level of intelligence. And when we do that, we can see that dinosaurs like Velociraptor had pretty big brains for a poodle sized animal. It put them in the zone of some modern birds and mammals today. Uh, things like T-Rex were not quite as smart, but they had pretty big brains for a reptile there 
size. And so they probably had pretty decent intelligence, all things considered. Now, some dinosaurs, like the long-necked dinosaurs, had smaller brains. Uh, they probably were not the, the smartest of animals. But by and large, dinosaurs were probably much more intelligent than we normally give them credit for. Hmm. And finally, what's, what's next for you? What's, what's your next project? Well, I, I love to write, and I, you know, I have a couple of pop science books for adults called The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs and The Rise and Reign of the Mammals, and I'm uh, working now, just started on, on the third one, the trilogy, let's say, which is going to all be all about birds. So you have to wait a few years, but I'll have a book out uh, all about birds in, in, in a few years, um, all about the history of birds, the evolution of birds, how they evolved from dinosaurs, how they made it to the modern day. So this is what I love to do. I love to communicate the science that uh, that we do. And I, I'm just uh, really flabbergasted always that there's people out there that are interested that want to read the stuff that I write and that I work on. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Steve. It was great yeah. talking with you. My pleasure. Great to talk with you. And until next time, we can talk birds one day. <laughs> Excellent. You're welcome back on the show anytime. Thank you. Yeah, and that was Steve Bursati, paleontologist. Check out Nat Geo Kids' new book, How to Survive in the Age of Dinosaurs. It's okay. awesome. Good evening. I'm Rachel Ratings Grabber, and I'm here with my partner, Todd Panicstorm. Some protesters spent their third day at City Hall today calling for cuts in spending for space and science. Organizers say they have no idea how science could be used in real life. And we have a breaking story. Astronomers report a large asteroid has just appeared from behind the sun. Preliminary estimates are that this asteroid has a diameter of 15 kilometers. Rachel? What's that for the 5% of the world still refusing to use metric? Well, I'll tell you, Todd. That's equivalent to 12,842 Hervé Villachezas laying along one edge of a plane. A plane. According to astronomers, the asteroid will be striking Earth in 4, 3, 2, 1. Bye, Super Megacorp! Uh, this asteroid strikes Los Angeles with the force of 150 million million tons of TNT. Well, I'll be. That's the energy of 7 billion 500 million Hiroshima bombs exploding at once. Thanks, Jules. In an instant, what was once a bustling metropolis was replaced by a transient crater in the ground 80 kilometers across and 28 kilometers in depth. The force of this impact caused the ground around the initial crater to collapse, filling the basin with debris. The final crater measures 140 kilometers across and 1,300 meters deep, with walls nearly as high as the Grand Canyon. The resulting air blast was the first effect of the impact felt outside Los Angeles. Steel buildings were knocked down as far away as San Jose and San Francisco. Wooden structures collapsed all over most of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, as far east as Orlando and Pittsburgh. Straw buildings? Well, <laughs> honestly, those weren't a great idea to begin with. I mean... The massive firestorm from the impact engulfed an area from Santa Barbara down to San Diego and the funnest place in the world, Tijuana! Clothing caught fire as far north as Portland, Oregon and eastward all the way through Arizona and a good part of New Mexico while the fireball was visible to people in Seattle and out to Albuquerque. Uh, debris thrown up by this ginormous impact fell back down to Earth in massive quantities, completely burying everything in Santa Barbara and piling higher than nearly all of the once mighty skyscrapers of San Diego, now mounds of twisted metal and shattered glass. Perhaps fittingly, Los Angeles gave North America one last earthquake on its way out. Across the entire region in which Los Angeles once sat, 
from Santa Clarita in the north to San Clemente in the south, the ground buckled, throwing objects like cars up into the air. Further out from San Francisco to Santa Clara, once firm ground cracked, lifting buildings off their foundations. From Sacramento in the north to Phoenix in the east, poorly made and older buildings cracked and walls tumbled, and pedestrians lost their footing as they walked along the street. Meanwhile, behemoth tsunamis formed by the collision raged through the Pacific Ocean, drowning low-lying lying coastal regions. Water rushing in from the world's largest body of water filled the crater, forming a new bay, greatly expanding space for an expanded Venice boardwalk, which will never be built. This debris, the remaining in the air, is likely to block out the sun for years, leading to crop failures around the globe, starving most of the life which survived the initial event. It appears the human race is run. Next week on the Cosmic Companion, we'll be exploring the water moons of our solar system, talking with Olivier Vatas, project scientist for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission from the European Space Agency, or ESA. Make sure to join us starting on the 10th of June. If you enjoyed this episode of the Cosmic Companion, what is wrong with you? I destroyed the world twice in the last half hour. <laughs> I like you. Uh, head on over to the CosmicCompanion.com and sign up for our newsletter and never miss an episode. Share, comment, follow, all that while you're there. The world's not over yet. I think. Clear skies.